Shobham. May I now call upon Dr. J. Shobham, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, Rio Cinnamon College, to deliver the welcome address and to introduce today's the most eminent speaker, Dr. S. Sam Manohar Das. Very good afternoon. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all on this third day of National Virtual Seminar. Under the able guidance of our Honorable Secretary, sir, and our respected principal, sir, and the magnificent leadership of our HOD mom, we are entirely into, we are entering into third day of FTP. Mm -hmm. And we hope the system will flow like a river from the mountain. On behalf of Department of Zoology, we welcome Dr. S. Sam Manohar, sir, Emeritus Professor, Department of Zoology, Scott Christian College, Nagar Koyal, who is the resource of this great seminar today. We sincerely welcome our dynamic HOD, Dr. D. Radhika Ma, to this scientific MTP. We also welcome to the organizing secretary, Dr. B. Keita Ma, whose tireless efforts make this event successful one. We also welcome all the staff members, scholars, student communities of zoology department of BOC College and the academics of, from other colleges and all other participants. It is my privilege to introduce our resource person who is one of the epitomes in zoological science. Biology is the science, entomology is the concept that makes biology interesting. This resource person, Dr. Yasam Manohar, has worked in Smart History College in Nagarpuri. He has worked 34 years of illustrious career in Smart Christian College. Who are in the dark side of student biological control. He is one of the stars in the sky of solid waste management. Though his accomplishment run into pages, let me share a few of his achievements. Dr. Samanar Sir has enormous interest in biological control and solid waste management. Under his knowledgeable guidance, more than 150 students have got their MP uh, student have got their MP degree, and more than 25 scholars have Sofa, ma'am, you are not audible. Ma'am, we can hear her. She is audible, ma'am. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Ma'am, you proceed. Sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So, more than 25 scholars have obtained their PhD degrees. We are sure that the person will become richer in knowledge through the insight of our emeritus professor of Scott Christian College. As I told, today is glory to be wisdom and state. Let us learn more than on this wisdom and state. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your kind words of welcome. Respected sir, I would now like to hand over the session to you. Sir, you want to begin the uh, session? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. And I'm very happy to be part of VOC College PG Zoology Virtual FDP on recent trends in entomology, RTE 2022. And I thank Dr. B. Gita, the organizing secretary for giving this unique opportunity to me. And I thank the coordinator, Dr. B. Radhika, head of the Department of Zoology the coordinator uh, of the program and principal of the college, who is the convener of the program, and the secretary, who is the patron of the entire program. And today's talk is on the management of hexapodon insects. A very large group among the hexapodons are insects. And when they occur as pests, when these insects 
occur as pests, we are really concerned about controlling them or managing them. The better word is management rather than control. And when we look at these different pests, are these insects always are having the pest status? So we have to think about this, think about and reconsider whether these insects are really pests. Sometimes under some circumstances, they are pests. And in other circumstances, if we find something useful in them, we try to say that they are useful insects. And I will also be sharing with you details about how insects are used as a protein source. And the main purpose of this discussion, maybe I'm going to share details which are known very clearly to you. Most of the things can be got from a textbook and from the web. I'm not presenting anything new except for some of the work done in our laboratory, maybe 10 years back or eight years back. And uh, some of the work I'm sharing with you. In fact, there are some papers also, but in spite of all that, I, uh, we find that most of these work are found in uh, the web or in books. And my duty is to uh, remind these things in a different perspective to students of zoology who are interested in entomology, to uh, research scholars, staff members who would like to take up research in this area because the young boys and girls belonging to the zoology department should appreciate the science of entomology because entomology is a wonderful science very closely related to human populations or human beings, especially in the tropical countries. When you are in the house, in the kitchen, you are likely to encounter insects. In the uh, dining room, you are en encountering different types of insects. And as you step out from your house on this doorstep, everywhere, there are plenty of insects around. And insects, um, the students of zoology should take special interest in insects because this is a very large group of animals. And insects happen to be the greatest group, the long, largest group. And I, I, I want to emphasize that insects have actually succeeded living in this world mil for millions of years, 400, 500 million years. And we have uh, to get so many things from these insects. We have to understand so many things. First slide, please. First slide. First slide. Yeah. Earlier slide, if it is possible, slide number one. And we are able to learn so many things from insects. Insects teach us so many things. And pardon the, ah, oh, yeah, right. And we have to learn so many things from insects. As we go through the slides, we'll be able to appreciate that because insects have thrived for such a long time. They have gone through so many climatic regularities, but still they are able to survive. And I will discuss with you the special ability of insects how they can survive different situations, be it a change in the environment or be it a physiological challenge or whatever it is, an ecological challenge, whatever challenge is there, insects are ready to face. So we have to first of all appreciate insects as a group of successful organisms. They are very, very successful because from time immemorial or more than 500 million years or 400 million years, they have been surviving. Uh, slide, next slide, please. Yeah, this is a uh, basic classification. I'll go through uh, fast. And the last is a phylum, a phylum arthropoda is hexapoda. Uh, and it includes insects, springtails, protura, and a group of 
um, uh, small organisms. And insects are hexapodans. Hexa means six, poda means legs. So they are six legged animals. So all insects invariably have six legs, three pairs of legs. And we also have Onychophora and uh, scorpions come under Calicerata, Crustacea, we have lobsters, prawn, and Myriapoda, millipedes, and centipedes. Next slide. That slide, please. Yeah, and we, um, in this chart, look at how many species have been described. So among the living species, about 1.65 million uh, insects have been, or arthropods have been described. And this is 12% of the entire uh, arthropods. So it is only 12%. So there is 88% left to be described. So this shows that there is a possibility for studying about insects, the taxonomy of them, taxonomy of different arthropods also, 88% undescribed, not described at all. So we can, the young students can go into this area and probe into, probe into the existence of different types of arthropods and especially insects. Next slide, please. Yeah, here we have uh, photographs of arthropods and one beetle is there and which is an insect. Next one, please. And here, uh, different crustaceans are shown. The crustacean grouping is Malacostreca, Astrocoda, uh, Maxillopoda, and Brangiopoda. And we can look at crabs, prawn, uh, brain shrimp, and a variety of crustaceans, which are economically very, very important. You know, the lobster industry or the prawn industry, uh, the shrimp industry, in fact, is uh, actually worth millions of dollars. Next one. Evelyn? Yeah, origin of hexapods. Uh, they are the oldest living forms. So I'll be telling you more about this as we uh, go ahead. They are the oldest living forms. And I would say that they are models of evolutionary success. They are models of evolutionary success. We speak about evolutionary success and they are models of evolutionary success. They have the capability to survive. They can survive under various conditions and they have the ability to counteract changes in the environment. Whatever changes there in the environment, be it an increase in temperature, increase in carbon dioxide tension, we'll see in the course of the discussion, all this. They are able to counteract these changes. And I also would like to tell you that terrestrial hexapods, especially insects and plants, terrestrial plants, they evolved together. Next slide. This is a pictorial representation of the evolutionary history of uh, hexapods. You can see that hexapods, and it is from the Ordovician times, uh, crustaceans have evolved, and hexapods came to land uh, sometime around the Ordovician or after that. And that is also connected with the evolution of terrestrial plants. Next. So I'm telling all this to you because I want you to appreciate how insects are a wonderful group of animals. So insects originated as per number of estimates. People say it is about 500, 480 to 500 million years ago in the Ordovician. At the same time, terrestrial plants also appeared on this globe. And there is a very strong uh, group of uh, a thought, a strong thought to say that insects have evolved from a group of crustaceans. Crustaceans, and there is one important thing about insects is the terrestrial insects that invaded the la land or came into the land, they evolved the capacity to fly. So they evolved flight adaptations. And this is evident from the oldest uh, insect fossil, uh, Rhinognatha hirsi. So this is this fossil is estimated 
to be 400 million years old. And this fossil shows that insects have started developing wings so that they can take on to the air from the surface of the earth. Next one. And during this long period of about 500 million years, the global climatic conditions kept on changing. There was a lot of change in the global climatic condition. And the insects also diversified. And in the, during the Carboniferous period, it is 356 to 299 million years ago, the winged insects, they underwent a major evolutionary uh, radiation. And endoterigota, they, uh, the insects with, uh, which show metamorphosis in their life history, uh, they underwent a major radiation in the Permian times, which is 299 to 252 million years ago. And with every change in the evolutionary history of the Earth, in the geological history of the Earth, we find that there is a uh, coexisting evolution of insects, evolutionary radiation of insects. Next one. And uh, as I have been telling you, insects are examples of coevolution. Insects are examples of coevolution. And we find that insects evolved, the Hymenoptera, Lepidoptera, Diptera, Coleoptera, they all evolved along with flowering plants. And many of the insects which are found in fossil records, preserved in amber, these insects are actually very closely related to, or they can even be added to the present extant genera. The insects which are extinct or insects which are found only in fossil record can be very clearly um, added to the present genera of insects or to the present groups of insects. And most of the insects, they evolve, especially Hymenoptera, Lepidoptera, Coleoptera, Diptera, they are very closely related to flowering plants. We know that how they are related. And their evolution is in connection with our is at the same time. That is why we call this as co-evolution. Flowering plants co-evolved with a number of uh, insect groups. Next slide, please. And uh, we come to a very interesting part of the discussion, and that is insect capabilities. And insect capability, I have been mentioning even earlier about how insects were able to thrive for millions of years under so much of climatic vagarities and changes in the environment. So they survived for several millions of years. Whatever climatic change is there, it will affect the insects, but they will find out methods by which they can come out of that environmental hazard or environmental change. I'm going to tell, give you a very previous slide only, please. Previous slide. Oh, yeah. Previous slide. Insect capable, yeah. I want to give you a very interesting in, uh, incident, a true one, about physiological adaptations of insects. One of my friends was working on insects, and he told me that he has come out with a particular molecule which prevents or which stops the molecule that carries vitellogenin to the ovary. And all of us, are, all of us know that vitellogenin is required for egg development in insects. So vitellogenin is not produced in the ovary. It is produced elsewhere in the body. It is transported by a particular molecule to the ovary. And um, he said, I have found out a molecule, located a molecule, which can stop this molecule which transports vitellogenin. I said, that's fine. And he said, if the, this is successful, it would be a, a new area of insect control. You can stop insects from producing eggs. So everybody was thinking about this. And after one year, when I again spoke to my friend over phone, he told me the experiments were carried out in the United Kingdom. And he told me, uh, how about your experiment? Were you able to uh, make a, a model or uh, were you able to come out with something solid? Then he said, nature is more powerful. He told me, nature is more powerful. I asked him, wow. He said, 
he was he found out a molecule he located a molecule which can stop the molecule that normally transports vitellogen but when final experiments were done they found out that vitellogenin was already available in the ovary of the insect he was studying on silkworm and he was wondering how that happened and when they examined a totally new molecule without the job of transporting vitellogenin has taken up the job of new job of transporting vitellogenin and because in the absence of the regular molecule that normally transports vitellogenin so insect body has so many fail safe systems if one system fails another system comes to play that role so you have to think about this and that is why insects are so successful for a, such a long period of time and like that uh, drought tolerance also i have to tell you more about this in one of the experiments we did on in our laboratory we found out that eudes aegypti the uh, eudes mosquito the larva can live only if the conditions are moist we provided moisture on a and kept the larvae on a cotton bed so the larvae cannot move cannot swim only there is trace of water there is moisture and food was supplied artificial food was supplied along with few drops of water that was made available to the larvae every day and after 6 days the larvae looked like simply like one day old uh, larvae and on the 6th day these larvae which looked so small when they were put back to water immediately they started growing and in a matter of 4 to 5 days they uh, went to the next stage and they came out as successful adults which could mate and produce eggs why i am telling you this is they have insects have such type of tolerance mechanisms which normally none of the animal groups have next slide and uh, hexapodan grouping uh, we have already seen this three smaller groups smaller groups of wingless arthropods columbola columbola is spring tails protura and diplora they are no longer uh, available along with insects they are under hexapods and insects also form a group of hexapods next slide and here we have a diagram shows the different uh, characteristic body parts of insects uh, there is a head thorax and abdomen the three tagmata tagmatization is uh, one of the aspects of evolution of insects and head has got a very um, a large brain comparatively large brain with the cephalic ganglia and uh, subesophageal ganglia the blood, blood vessel uh, as in any other invertebrate is on the dorsal side they have tubular hearts not like uh, hearts of human beings chambered hearts it's a long tubular heart and that heart itself keeps pumping for any number of days or years till the insect lives so there is no problem as to stopping of the heart or anything like that they have the ability to survive and we also can see the double ventral nerve cord and the crop crop of insects so this is the normal the anus portion is there and spiracles are there tracheal respiration is there in insects next slide and the hexapodan or insect head basic structures i just mentioned the names of the different parts acron is not a segment it is a pre segmental projection which bears the insect eyes and this is absent in protura and diplora and uh, there are six segments in the head which are very closely fused and in segment 1 there is no appendage segment 2 antennae are there and this is absent antennae are absent in protura segment 3 no appendages segment 4 mandibles uh, seg segment 5 maxilla mouth is in between segment 4 and segment 5 and the sixth segment is labium the lower lip and one part of the sixth segment upper projection of the sixth segment forms the upper lip or 
labra. And in true insects, ectognathous mouth parts are seen. If you look at cockroach, you can look at all the mouth parts. So it's an example of ectognathous mouth parts. And in certain groups, the mouth parts are enveloped and we um, uh, uh, name it as endognathous. Next to it. And insect thorax is very important. Three segments are there. All the three segments on the ventral side carry, uh, each segment carry one pair of legs. Altogether, six legs are there. And in winged insects, all the pterygoids, we find there are two, normally two pairs of wings are uh, one pair of wings are also there. So two pair of wings on the second and the uh, third segment, one pair on the second and one pair on the third. And this is, this is on the dorsal side. And they have walking legs or legs which are helpful for walking or one part of the leg alone is used for walking, which is actually divided into five different segments. And gills are also in some of the insects associ associated with uh, the legs of insects. And in certain others, it is seen in the abdominal region. And uh, it is believed the crustacean, the gill branches of crustaceans are comparable to the wings that are present on the second and third segments, thoracic segments of insects. So gill branches of crustaceans are comparable to the wings that are found on the dorsal side of the second and third thoracic segments. And in some of the insects, the wings, they um, appear as or they come out as um, extensions of the upper region of the thorax, the thoracic segments, upper region, it comes out as extensions of the segments. Next. And uh, abdomen, uh, there are two types of development. One is epimorphic and another is anamorphic. In epimorphic uh, development, which is available, uh, seen in all the hexapods, we find that at the all the segments, all the abdominal segments, there are about 11 segments, all the abdominal segments are available after the, at the end of the embryonic development. But in the anamorphic group, all the segments are not available, only three or four segments are available. And with every molting, segments will be added on to the abdomen. Right, next. And there are 11 segments. And in some species, Protura, it is 12. Uh, in Columbola, six segments are there. Sometimes only four segments are available. And normally there are uh, no appendages on the abdominal segments. And the external genitalia are there, which are comparable to the appendages in the abdominal region. And if you look at cockroach also, you can see uh, anal cerci. Circus circuit, uh, one pair at the last segment of the abdomen, and that is the only appendage normally seen in the abdominal region. Next, next slide. Yeah, and insects as pests. So, a part of the discussion is about the insect as pest, and only when we consider insect or hexapods as pests will be able to come out with non-conventional control methods. And uh, the word pest itself, as I told in the beginning of the discussion, uh, I won't say it is a misnomer, but it is a word which can be used in many different senses. So insect, we call a particular insect a pest when it damages our uh, cultivated plants, agricultural plants, or when it is consuming the food that is meant for us. And when it is consuming animal feed, we call that particular insect as a pest. And sometimes if you look at uh, stored grain pests, these pests come into any stored grain system, damage the grains, then leave behind a lot of odor, excretory products, and also body parts, and that will actually 
reduce the market marketability of that product. So insects uh, can thus cause indirect losses to human consumers by damaging a large quantity of grains stored or damaging agricultural uh, lands. And uh, there are 6 million insect species. And we find that 20 to 30% of them are insect pests. Next. Next slide. Yeah. And we find that insect herbivory pests uh, are damaging plants through herbivory. And uh, we have to look at this fact. When such insects, pests are there in any agricultural system, they may not kill the plant. They can kill the plant sometimes, but most of the times they don't kill the plant, but they will damage the plant to an extent that it cannot normally uh, yield uh, harvest or yield uh, fruit. So damage would be there, but it may not kill the plant. And these insects, they feed on tissues. And sometimes they suck the sap also. And we find that plants have a lot of systems, defense systems against these insects. Sometimes some of the insect parts are uh, not tasteful. Uh, if you just walk along the road, you look at uh, different types of plants. And some of the plants, you, you can see that insects have damaged. Uh, eaten away leaves and other parts of such plants. But if you look at certain other plants, you find that insects never go near that plant. Why? Because those plants have certain harmful substances or distasteful uh, materials in their system, which will not allow the insect to go near it. Insects also don't feel like going near that plant and that plant is saved. And uh, even the presence of thorns in plants, uh, certain types of irritating hairs. These prevent insects from going, going near these plants. And also, there is one important system in the plants. If a plant is damaged by an insect, immediately the plant sends an SOS signal, save our soul signal uh, outside to other organisms, other insects, which immediately come and kill the pest which is attacking the plant. So this has been very clearly proved. And this is one area of interest, uh, especially research is going on in this area, how the chemicals that are available in the plant, in the damaged part of the plant, can attract insects, predatory insects, which would kill the insect that is damaging the plant. Next. Yeah, this is one example of a gall wasp, which is an invasive pest. It has entered India and in southern India and especially in southern Tamil Nadu, this is a great problem. You would have heard about this uh, insect and also the plant, which is called the coral tree, which produces red colored flowers. Uh, and this particular plant is being attacked by the Erythrina gall wasp, Quadrasticus erythrinae. And this wasp actually pr produces galls on the plant that the plant is not able to survive. And uh, an example has been given. This is based on a work in Thiruvananthapuram district. Since uh, April 2005, this pest, Erythrina gall wasp, is seen in very large numbers. So when we speak about pests, this type of invasive pests are uh, becoming more and more uh, uh, predominant in our country. In our country, this is because we use so many types of chemicals to kill the insects which are available in our system, the regular normal insects available in our system. And when the invasive species comes into that area, it finds that area quite comfortable for its existence. And once it becomes an invasive species, it is very difficult to control. Next slide, please. And this is white fly, the rugos spiraling white fly. And it is a great threat to coconut in India. 
especially in southern India, coconut plantations are there in Tamil Nadu, Kerala. And we find it very difficult because white flies are very difficult to control. They are normally found under the leaves and whatever spray is done, spraying is on the upper surface. Say maybe in a house garden, you can go for spraying the under surface of leaves, but not in a commercial garden. And what? And after the spraying is over, it will remain underneath the leaf. And after that, it will again come out and damage the leaves. It keeps uh, sucking sap from the leaves and the leaves wither and the entire plant is affected. Next slide. Uh, yeah, there are 442 species of white flies which are available in India now. And there are three invasive species. Names are given. The spiraling white fly, solanum white fly, and rugose spiraling white fly. And uh, it is polyphagous in nature with a high reproductive uh, potential. And to make things worse, these white flies, actually, they are vectors of number of plant viral diseases. Viral diseases, as you know, Viral diseases are very hard to control and uh, they also occur so fast. And there are viral diseases of plants also and white flies are responsible for uh, vectoring many of these plant viral diseases. Next slide. And this is another uh, big uh, pest uh, it is the oriental fruit fly, again an invasive species, uh, Batrosira dorsalis, and every fruit, every fruit in the sense many of the vegetables are also attacked by this fruit fly, which will lay eggs inside vegetables or fruits. The eggs are laid, the eggs hatch, and the larvae eat the fruit from inside. And after some time, we find that the entire fruit is affected be it goa, be it mango, uh, be it bitter gourd, whatever vegetable or uh, fruit is there, it is being affected by this fruit fly. And here we see a distribution of the uh, fruit fly, the oriental fruit fly, which is highly injurious. So why all these uh, slides are shown to you, the invasive species? And it is up to uh, people who are interested in entomology, students of entomology, to design methods by which these invasive species could be controlled or managed. And if you look into statistics, we find a very huge proportion of vegetables and fruits are affected by the fruit fly. And the white fly is affecting cotton and many other plantations. And if you can do something, it is only you, an entomologist, who can do something about controlling this uh, insects, insect pests. I told you that pest is really one insect or group of insects which affect or which are against human interests. When we have some plantation, we want to reap the harvest and these insects don't allow us to reap the harvest. So anyway, we must design methods by which we have to control these insects as, as much as possible. Next, next slide. Yeah, and integrated pest management or pest management. And uh, one of the definitions say that pests compete for food with human beings, and also they are likely to transmit certain diseases. So now you can control them using uh, integrated pest management, which comprises of so many different inclusions and uh, it can be like use of natural resources, natural arthropod resources or other resources available. And, and uh, uh, in using when we are um, adopting integrated pest management, that protects the environment. We, we never use materials that damage the env environment, but we use only materials or chemicals that will actually help the environment and never go against the interest of the uh, environment. And the last word is very important, in a sustainable way. So whatever we do, pest management or whatever we do, it has to be sustainable. Say when we are growing mango, you cannot uh, 
put a chemical which is costing lakhs of rupees because it is not sustainable. When we are in, investing so much amount of money, we must get returns also. So when I say sustainable, it has to be economic, it has to, it has to be uh, favoring the environment, and we have to make use of available natural resources. Next slide, please. And many times uh, I told you, and here is an example, we call insects as pests. And sometimes these pests can become pets also, friends also. And I have given you an example. It is Parthenium. We'd have seen Parthenium plants everywhere. And that plant is um, very uh, injurious to human beings because it is responsible for causing dermatitis in human beings. And um, there is no method by which these Parthenium plants could be uh, removed. Everywhere Parthenium, in most of the wastelands, you go around to any town, any city, you find lots and lots of Parthenium plants. And later on, uh, it was found out that Mexican beetle, Saigogramma species, can control Parthenium. And it will feed on Parthenium and kill the entire Parthenium plantation. So Mexican beetles have been brought to India and brought to Bangalore. They were um, brought to Bangalore uh, from Mexico. And the beetles were released in many parts of the country. And the beetles were actually feeding upon Parthenium and uh, removing those plants. See, this is a pest which is attacking a plant. Because the plant is not useful to us, Parthenium is not useful to us, it is only injurious. We say that this particular beetle is highly helpful. So I told you right from the beginning that the pest or pet is actually, it is human thinking. It is from the perspective of human livelihood. If it is supporting human beings, we call it a pet. If it is against human beings, we call it a pest. Right. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, here we have a, a diagram which shows that um, insects are part of the food chain, mosquito larvae, dragonfly larvae, and these are insects which are part of a food chain. And this is only a small food chain, but number of food chains are there in which insects are forming essential uh, parts of that food chain. So insects are essential parts of food chains. And you cannot simply remove from the globe any insect without damage. Any organism is there. Any organism in this globe has got some work to perform, some duty to perform. It is part of a system. It is part of a system and we have to find that out and appreciate it. Simply, you cannot wipe off a group of insects or group of animals from this globe. And next diagram also shows that. Yeah, this also shows uh, herbivorous insects and predaceous insects uh, in the ecosystem. This is a food chain uh, uh, which incorporates insects. And if you probe into this, you'll find number of food chains. Some of them are openly seen and some of them are not so clearly seen, but you can find out that most of the insects, most of the insects, even small insects are part of a larger food chain. They form one part of the food web. So they are really important. Next. Next slide, please. Yeah, and we find that there are certain essential roles played by insects. They cycle nutrients, pollination is there, seed dispersal is there, and soil fertility maintenance also is there. And they control the population of other organisms. And even they are a food source to many other groups of organisms. So I told you right from the beginning that you can never ignore insects because insects have essential roles to play in the whole ecosystem, the whole globe. Next. Yeah, and we are coming to the control of insects, management of insects, and 
pesticides have been used as per records from 2500 BC onwards. Uh, Sumerians were using sulfur and the Chinese were, they were set to use 200, uh, in 200 BC botanical insecticides and copper sulfate and lime. Uh, it is called Borodox mixture. It was used on uh, grape uh, fruits. And actually, uh, there is irony. Uh, the mixture was applied over grapefruits just to prevent uh, school students from stealing these uh, grapes. So normally, if there is a grape garden, students would enter in, young children would enter in, and they would remove these uh, fruits for eating. And to prevent these students or young children from eating the uh, grape fruits, Borodox mixture was applied over the fruits. And it was found. It was actually uh, found out by Millardet and many others that this mixture, it prevents downy mildew, a fungal disease of grapes. And they started using this chemical mixture. And even now, this chemical mixture, Borodax mixture, is very popular. Next slide. Yeah, uh, pesticides, chemical pesticides and biological control. So chemical pesticides are uh, being used very popularly from 1890, 1900, mm -hmm. from the 19th century. And uh, pyrethrum, nicotine, DDT, these are chemicals which are being used. And um, people were so much engrossed with chemical insecticides, pesticides, they even forgot about biological control and research, even research on biological control was abandoned. Nobody wanted research on biological control because they have come up with very uh, powerful chemicals which can kill any insect. So there is no problem. Why should we go for biological control, which is not effective as, as effective as chemical control. But in 1962, a book came out. The book, name of the book is Silent Spring. And that book was written by Rachel Carson. And in that book, a lot of information was available on pest resistance, how pesticides affect the ecosystem. And it is said that book is a turning point. 1962, when that book came, it was very much appreciated and people started knowing about the ill effects of chemicals. What it, what it will be if lots and lots of chemicals are pumped into the ecosystem? What are the ill effects? And people then started going more for biological control, more for non-chemical, non-conventional control. And the DDT, uh, there was a global ban on DDT and use of other chemicals also decreased. Next slide, please. And biological control uh, is using a biological organism or a biological material, a plant material or a microbe to control any insect or any insect pest or whatever organism we are trying to control. Even in earlier times, in ant colonies were used to control caterpillars and uh, beetles. Caterpillars and beetles were pests in many of the gardens and ant colonies were brought into that garden and these ants, they devoured all the caterpillars and beetles. And one of the fungal organisms which was used for a very long period of time is Metarhysium anisophile, the green muscadine fungus, which controls a number of insects. Most of the insects can be controlled by this particular fungus uh, because it is entomoph pathogenic and Machnikov only uh, he ex first explained about the importance of this uh, fungus in controlling insects. The fungal spores were used to control different types of insect pests. Next slide. And this is a diagram about IPM, integrated pest management. I told you even earlier that it is a management strategy uh, which is used, uh, which is, it's not a, remember, it's not a single strategy. In IPM, sometimes we use, make use of chemicals also, but in restricted quantities, not in very large quantity. In restricted quantities, chemicals are used, plant materials are used, 
predatory insects are used, fungal spores and other microbes are used. So all this complement each other and we achieve some amount of control over the insect pest and that is known as integrated pest management, which is uh, nowadays said to be the most advantageous and popular method of controlling insects. Whenever you come out with the IPM scheme, it is highly beneficial because we do not damage the environment. We do not damage anything. The harvest is there. The insect pest also, it is actually uh, deterred from entering into that system. And integrated pest management is a group of methods applied on a single plantation or on groups of plantations to control different types of insect pests. Next slide. And these are predators which are excellent killers of insect pests. And we have lacewing, ladybug beetle, and the spiders are also there. Again, parasites are, uh, parasitoids are there, which will lay eggs on insect eggs, on pest eggs, eggs of insect pests, or on larvae. You can see in this photograph, um, eggs are laid on a caterpillar. And when parasitoids lay eggs, like this, most of the parasitoids are Hymenopterans, and when they ex lay eggs like this, the entire larva will be killed because the eggs hatch, eggs of the Hymenopteran hatch, the wasp hatches, and all the eggs will enter into the body of the caterpillar, and the caterpillar is devoured and killed. And only more number of these wasps come out and again go in search of the caterpillars or eggs available in that particular garden. Next. And uh, non-conventional controlled methods are there. So in non-conventional methods, uh, so many methods are available. And some of the methods, um, I have some knowledge about some of the methods. Uh, they are, uh, the list is exhaustive. I'm giving you a very small list. Plant derivatives can be used uh, for controlling insect pests. Biosmoke is something which can be used for controlling insect pests. Biosmoke is so smoke generated by uh, burning some plant material. Smoke is generated by uh, burning plant material. Uh, you would say that uh, smoke is injurious, smoke is bad, of course. But this smoke comes out from a biological material and in a controlled way, it can be used to uh, manage some of the insect pests, especially uh, which are available in stored grains. In stored grains, it is customary to use uh, chemicals like phosphine. And phosphine, such chemicals are uh, more injurious compared to smoke, especially smoke generated from plant materials. You can go for turmeric smoke, which is very costly. Turmeric is extremely costly and such smoke can never be used, I believe. But we can use smoke generated by burning waste leaves or uh, some of the plant material and porous earthen parts. These earthen parts are prepared in a special way, very small parts. Uh, this was done by one of our students uh, for his PhD work, which was very much appreciated. And inside uh, these um, earthen parts, the previous slide, please. Inside these earthen parts, you can uh, put in some plant material, maybe neem leaf or something like that, which will not get mixed with uh, uh, stored material, stored flour or stored grain. And through the pore, pests that are available. Can you show the previous slide? One moment. Yeah. And sound waves, I'll be mentioning about all this. And um, ever new methods can be identified. And it is up to, as I've been telling, it is up to young students to identify new methods. Next slide. Yeah, this is visible light. This is in a storage system. 
making use of an insect trap and insect traps have been designed by Tamil Nadu Agricultural University and uh, we made use of different colored lights and yellow color was found to be very attractive and this was very much appreciated by experts from the agricultural uh, college university. Next slide. And um, brew kits, brew kits are uh, pests of grains, pulses, normally pulses, and a special a storage bin was constructed. And this was part of the research work of one of our students, Dr. Kiruba. And uh, a special bin was constructed and in that pulses were allowed. And whenever there is infestation by brew kits, it could be controlled naturally by a wasp. I told you parasites, uh, parasitoids are there. A hole was made which would allow only that parasitoid. So there is no question of infestation from any other pest, but only this parasitoid will grow inside and it will kill all the brew kits that were available in the system. Next one. And audible sound waves. Sound waves are capable of killing insects. This has been published. And uh, next slide. Uh, this is, I told you about biosmoke in the management of tribolium castanium, the red flower beetle. Next one. Next slide. And number of areas of uh, research are um, available and uh, global climatic change, global climatic change. There is increase in temperature which is a regular phenomenon. And all of us know that there is a heavy increase in temperature, atmospheric temperature. And also there is a concomitant increase in carbon dioxide levels also. And our uh, research can be, our younger entomologists and uh, students who are interested in entomology can go into areas of uh, insect research related to climatic change. And one of the areas is how insects are able to resist climate change, increase in temperature or increase in carbon dioxide. And they, are, they have the mechanism to resist these changes. So this is one area of interest. Next slide. And temperature, uh, there is an estimate which says there will be an increase of uh, temperature by four degrees C, which is a very heavy increase at the end of the current century. And as the ambient temperatures increase, the pest infestations are also expected to increase because the increased temperature will favor, even in temperate countries, insects will start developing. Insects will start developing and this will uh, favor the insect pest. Next one. And how uh, temperature, affects insect pests. This is a pictorial representation. Uh, one of the problems is outbreak of plant diseases transmitted by insects. So we discussed even in the beginning that some of the insects like white flies can transmit viruses or other microbes which can cause microbial diseases. So there is a problem of transmission of diseases by insect pests. Next. And Global warming, I told you that many of the insects can tolerate global warming, but remember that global warming kills also. A study was done on 1,100, uh, 1,100 species of insects. And, and uh, it is estimated that 15 to 37% of these insects, uh, 1,100 species will become extinct by 2050. And these are, uh, changes in global warming are the changes in global warming when insects can tolerate it is not all the insects some insects can tolerate but there are insects which succumb to the uh, global changes in the in, uh, uh, global environmental changes like temperature change next slide and uh, this is about overwintering See, most of the insects in temperate climates, very cold climates, they, during the winter season, they hibernate, they sleep. 
they sleep and they don't have any physiological activity. But when the temperature increases due to global warming, this cycle will be affected. The overwintering cycle will be affected. The insects will come out. And the, when the insects will come out too soon that there is loss of synchrony with the host plant. The insect will come out too soon because the temperature has increased, the diapers will be closed, insect comes out, but it finds that there is no host plant because the climate in the outer uh, world is different and host plant has no leaves. So naturally, the insect population will uh, die. So for overwintering insects, increase in global temperature is a major problem. Next. And already a poleward shift in distribution is, has been uh, noted and their insects are shifting to higher altitudes because the lower altitudes are becoming warmer. They want to keep themselves cool. They are moving on to higher altitudes. And uh, there is uh, information about the European corn borer, Astrinia nivalis, uh, which has shifted northward 1,000 kilometers. A small insect has migrated 1,000 kilometers. So there is one more problem also, decrease in the number of generations. The decrease in the number of generations also has been noted as a, a result of global warming. Next one. And carbon dioxide levels increase and we have plants uh, in which the carbon dioxide level has its effect. When carbon dioxide is available in plenty, um, plants take up the carbon dioxide and they, through photosynthesis, synthesize more food. But there is a next slide. There is a problem. There is a, uh, um, there is loss of synchrony in CN ratio. Next slide, please. Carbon-nitrogen ratio. And only if there is proper carbon-nitrogen ratio, the insects can survive. Insects need nitrogen for their existence. And if the nitrogen level is low, carbon uh, carbo carbohydrate level is very high, insects cannot thrive and the food is not uh, nutritive for them. Such, say, such a uh, plant food which is made under high carbon dioxide level is not nutritive enough for insects. Next slide. Yeah, this also tells about how the CN ratio affects. The CN ratio affects the insect population. Only if nitrogen is available in normal doses, then normal uh, level, the insects can thrive properly. Otherwise, they have to eat more of plant food, more of plant tissue, get enough amount of nitrogen. So what will happen? The plant will be totally damaged. The, an insect which normally eats a small quantity of leaf will have to eat more because it needs nitrogen for its development, right? Next slide. And this is a uh, diagram shows the uh, carbon dioxide impact increase and uh, increase in development rate time has been noticed and a decrease in pest abundance because the pest population may dwindle, may come down. Next slide. Rain also, precipitation is rain. Rain also uh, has a very big problem. And now we know that the rainfall is high. The drought also is very severe. Both are extremes. If there is a rainfall, it is extreme. If there is drought, it is extreme. So that condition, actually, uh, it threatens insect survival. It can't, insects can't survey normally. Next slide. This is a diagram which shows the effects of precipitation. Heavy precipitation, uh, decreased overwintering, smaller insects are washed away, and uh, if it is a drought, the plant becomes more susceptible to insect attack. Next slide, please. And, and insects, I told you this in the beginning of a discussion, uh, insects which undergo a winter diapers, they are much affected when the global temperature increases and 
there are two groups of insects, freeze tolerant insects and freeze avoiding insects. Freeze avoiding insects, they don't stay in uh, a condition where the temperature is low. Freeze tolerant insects, they can undergo diapause and they can stay in a place where the temperature is very low. And uh, next is uh, diapause on ecosystem. We may think that what the diapause of an insect group has to do with the uh, insect, uh, the entire ecosystem. We find that ecosystem, plant consumption, pollination, so many uh, uh, things in the ecosystem are connected uh, directly with insects. And if the diapause is disrupted, I told you, if the diapause is disrupted in the middle, insects come out, come out of diapause and find to their surprise, there is no food available to them. So similarly, if diapause is broken, it can affect the stability of the entire ecosystem. Next slide. This is one example. Uh, the green stink bug, Nesseria viridula, only diapausing adults can survive or which can survive winters. They can only go for overwintering. Only diapausing adults, if they are available, they can go for overwintering. Uh, and it is found that as these insects are reaching, as they develop, when they are reaching the nymphal stages, it is already cold climate. And a nymph cannot undergo diapause. And if a nymph cannot undergo diapause, the entire population is uh, washed away. That is why I have named this as diapause doom. So diapause leads to the doom of the entire insect species. One example is the green stink bug. Next slide. So we have to, uh, so I'll close in a few minutes. Um, about the beneficial insects. Beneficial insects, I have been telling earlier also, uh, pollination, pest control, so in agriculture, uh, if, if, if a particular insect group is controlling pests, we call them as beneficial. Again, it is based on human perspective. Right. Next slide. And here we have producer insects. Uh, we have the lac insect, uh, honeybee and uh, silkworm. Uh, Multi-million dollar industries are there. And these are productive insects. And we have to be proud that insects are responsible for uh, the uh, turnover of crores and crores of dollars, millions of dollars or trillions of dollars. And these are producer insects. Next. I have a list of beneficial exopodents. I have already mentioned about many of them. These are all, most of them are predatory. They can kill insect pests. Next one. And I told you, insect predators and uh, parasites, they are friendly insects. And we always want friends. We always want the company of friends. And these insects and the ladybirds, lacewings, they are normally killing other insects, which are pests. And there are other parasitoids which damage the larvae, damage the eggs of pests. Next. And pests are pets. And uh, we find butterfly, grasshopper, ants, so many insects, which we may consider as pests, but they are also pets. If you look at a small child, the child will run after butterfly. And butterfly would be its, uh, the child's greatest pet. So you, cannot, you can never say that a particular insect is a pest or a pet. The larva of a butterfly the caterpillar can be highly injurious to plants, but the adult butterfly is a pet. Next. And this I'll mention, see, transgenic plants incorporate uh, Bt genes, Bt genes that produce delta endotoxin. And in one of the studies, uh, it was found that uh, these plants do not allow, or these plants do not allow infestation or um, we allow lepidopteran pests. They, these transgenic plants normally, now there are other types of transgenic plants also, the normal transgenic plants with the uh, cry genes, they 
can prevent lepidopterans from attacking uh, the plants. But what about the other sucking pests? The number of sucking pests will increase and this will eventually lead to a competition between the two or an imbalance between sucking pests and the biting pests like caterpillars. So if transgenic plants are planted, uh, the other problems, uh, apart from the other problems, which may be worth mentioning, apart from the other problems, we have to look at the two types of pests, the biting pests or chewing pests and the pests which are sucking. And there is always an imbalance between the two pests and many times the sucking pests outnumber the chewing pests and damage the plants. In spite of the plants being transgenic, they damage the plants. Now they are trying their level best to incorporate more genes which can control the sucking pests also. Next one. Uh, next slide, next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. Next slide. Or we are coming to the last part of the discussion in which we are talking, going to talk about endomophagy. Insects can be used as food. Uh, I was interested in this because uh, there was in our lab, we cultured Calisobruches maculatus, um, and also uh, Casaira cephalonica, a lepidopteran pest, pest of uh, stored flower. And this pest will have a very large caterpillar. Looks so beautiful, so white in color. And I used to wonder how these uh, insects, how these uh, caterpillars are converting carbohydrates into proteins. So these larvae contain large quantities of proteins and these insect proteins can be used in the place of proteins from beef and other animals. So in the place of other animals, insect proteins can be used. And this is the last part of the uh, discussion. And even in our title, we are uh, telling that uh, these insects can be protein sources. I have some uh, uh, the next uh, yeah, crustaceans as food and insects are also as food. This is in Thailand where insects are being eaten. Many maggots are eaten, uh, worms are eaten. So many types of insects are being eaten. Next slide. Next slide. Please. And we have a list um, of countries, list of countries, I mean, uh, the list of continents in which uh, the species are actually which number of species which are eaten. So insects, and we find that in Asia, 29 countries are consuming insects as food. And insects are easy to culture also. It is more easier compared to other larger animals. So our protein uh, requirement may be met by insects. This is going to be in the near, in the near future, this is going to be the case and we have a lot of um, areas of research, avenues of research in this particular area. Next slide. And insects were used even for as food 400, for at least 400 million years. And this is a statistics. And um, when more number of human beings uh, are there in the globe, we have to find out protein sources. Single cell proteins are there. And these insect proteins also uh, can be a very good substitute. Right. Next three slides. These are uh, not very clear. The orders, the different orders and the species which are uh, belong belonging to these orders, which are used in different areas. Uh, this can be, you can get it in case you want this chart, you can get it. Uh, this chart gives us an idea about the different groups of insects and from each group, what insect is being used as food and which country it is being used as food, right? And the last part of the discussion is about medicinal value of the insects. And insects have got a high medicinal value. Insects have been and insect and insect products have been used for controlling uh, common diseases, as well as diseases like uh, cancers, cancers of the system. It is believed that uh, insect products and the insect themselves 
can act against cancer cells. And I strongly believe that the young students who listen to this will one day come out with many products which are useful to human beings. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity. And I believe that many of you would have uh, thought in terms of there are so many areas of entomology which are yet to be probed. There are a number of insects which have to be described uh, now. Only a very limited number have been uh, described. So there is poss possibility for you to describe various groups of insects. And I wish uh, the audience of this program will greatly benefit by going into entomology, the area of research in entomology and prosper. Thank you. Thank you, uh, VOC College Management and uh, Dr. Gita for giving this opportunity. Thank you to the, to the listeners. And I thank Dr. Uh, Kirwa also, who is the co-author of this preparation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now the session is open for discussion. Participants, if you have any queries, you may contact. Thank you, Sam, sir, thank you. for a nice presentation, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Participants, the session is open for discussion. Sir, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving a lot of information about entomology. Uh, actually, I uh, about uh, you, you mentioned about SOS uh, that save our soul like that. I can't get that one, sir. SOS. Uh, that uh, chemical signal. Exactly. Oh, that one. Okay. Ah, yeah, when plants are damaged, I didn't give the names of that those chemicals. When plants are damaged by... Uh, herbivorous insects Thank you, sir. and produces certain chemicals which can attract insects that will kill kill these uh, herbivorous insects. Oh, oh, plant will kill, sir? Uh, yeah. plant no, 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 not plants. The plant okay. will attract other insects, predator okay. insects that will kill the insects that are harming the plant. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. That one. Okay, thank you, sir. Then one thing, sir, uh, that uh, you have mentioned about invasive species, sir. Invasive ah. species. How it uh, uh, come? If uh, if uh, other animals and all, uh, we'll mention about uh, if uh, we like fast growth and all, we have uh, get it on the uh, culture here. How it enter into our uh, our country and uh, it is adaptable uh, to our environment, sir. Yeah, through agriculture products, through ship, uh, okay. through uh, any conveyance that they can come. The the way they come in can't easily be identified. But once they come in, if they find the uh, conditions conducive, they continue here, invasive species. Okay. Okay. And Thank finally, you. our species cannot survive, but these species survive uh, uh, to such a high extent. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other queries? Questions? Do you have any queries? What is available for us? Uh, Niranjani, ma'am, you can go for the next uh, phase, ma'am. Okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, with great pleasure, I now invite Dr. S. Gomati, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, to propose the order of times. Yes. Good afternoon to all. It's my great pleasure to propose the formal order of times. 
now i would like to thank our honorable secretary our respected principal dr sri virabahu our head and associate professor dr t radhika coordinator dr p kita organizing secretary of this program thank you all i would like to offer my deep sense of gratitude to our resource person dr sam manoharan emeritus professor zoology department scott christian college nagarkovil who has delivered a good lecture on the field of non conventional management of exopodons and their utilization as potential protein sources i thank all the staff members of our department i also place and record my sincere thanks thanks to the participants from other colleges universities and organization thank you all i also express my th sincere thanks to dr komadi nayagam head computer science department and his team for supporting us technically to conduct this program successfully thank you sir once again i thank one and all thank you thank you dear ma'am for your kind words of acknowledgement dear participants i hope this day would have been more enlightening and factual once again thank you dear participants wishing you all a splendid evening participants the feedback link is being posted in the chat box